right hand and repeat after me. I, Sammy Morris. I, Sammy Morris. Do solemnly affirm. I do solemnly affirm. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Ohio. The Constitution of the State of Ohio. The codified ordinances. The codified ordinances. And the Charter of the City of Cleveland. And the Charter of the City of Cleveland. And that I will faithfully. And I will faithfully. morning. I am calling the Municipal Service and Properties Committee to order this morning. Uh, today is um, 1 9, January 9th, 2023. Madam Secretary, can you please call the roll? Bishop. Here. Mooney. Here. Harrison. Jones. Casey. Present. Moore. Here. Star. Here. Thank you, Madam, Madam Clerk. Uh, first, I want to start off by saying uh, to the committee that uh, I, I want to uh, express my appreciation for our colleague, our outgoing colleague, uh, Councilman Brian Mooney. Uh, we wish you well in all future endeavors, and I just want you to express that we are grateful for what you've done for this committee and this council. Uh, Councilman Mooney, would you, would you like to say a couple words? Uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll talk tonight at the meeting, but I do appreciate the thoughts. Okay. And hopefully we'll pick, uh, we'll pick somebody who will do as good or hopefully better than I, I served. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to start off with uh, public uh, works. Happy New Year, Director. Good morning, sir. Okay, this is ordinance number 1212-2022. By council members uh, McCormick, Bishop, Harrison, and Griffin, by departmental request, this is an emergency ordinance authorizing the commissioner of purchases and, purchases and supplies to sell certain city-owned property no longer needed for city public uh, use located on West 22, Street to 1869 West 22, LLC for the purpose of residential development. Okay, Director, can you explain um, the um, parcels involved and can you explain, we had a little discrepancy as far as the locating the parcels that was in question that we were selling, uh, parcel number, um, 048, 049, and 050. Oh, we really couldn't find them on the um, on the uh, county map. So, could you go into uh, explain in detail about what uh, where the parcels at, and um, just give us a briefing on it? Yes, to the uh, chair, to the council. Uh, I will defer to my colleague, Director DeRosa, for this uh, piece of legislation. Okay. Um, so, so, Mr. Chairman, the, the, um, you're right that you can't find these PPNs on the county website, and that's kind of what created this, um, this issue to begin with. When the developer purchased this piece of property, which has an apartment building on it, 
um, the county records showed that they were purchasing uh, land that included these three PPNs. So there was an error in the county records that showed that a private owner owned all of this land when in fact there were three PPNs that were owned by the city of Cleveland. And we purchased that land back in 1943 for a playground. Um, there's no playground there, um, um, you know, for quite some time. It's kind of at the back of the West Side Market parking lot off of, um, you know, West uh, 22nd Street. Um, but but um, the county, we do have legal descriptions. We did find the deed, and the county will transfer these, you know, once we go through, um, you know, the city and council process, um, even though there's an error in their records currently. And I, there is a map that was included with, that should be on your tablet, and it highlights where those parcels are, even though they're not separate PPNs in the um, county records currently. So now the parcels are in this um, this little thing, say city parcels on the back side of it, looks like a little, um, look like a state. The, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And then, Mr. Councilman, so the, the, uh, the, the, the need for those parcels are so that um, the, um, bless you, the property owner is going to build um, like a, a, a parking structure with a, um, with a deck on top of it that would be amenity uh, and an amenity to the uh, refurbished apartment building. And so this parcel is needed to get into that parking area. Okay, now the praise value is, is what? on this property? So the appraised value is $6,600, and there is an error when you look at the sale price. There is a zero left off of that one line on the legislative summary, but right up above it, it shows the right value, which is $6,600, which um, doesn't seem like much, but that's how the appraiser came up with the value of this parcel, seeing as how there's, um, you know, it's kind of at a dead end um, off, off to the corner there with uh, not a lot of access. So, uh, di uh, director, so three parcels on right behind the West Side Market is only worth $6,600 is what you're saying? Uh, or do we, do we trust that valuation? We, we did dig into that because there were, um, you know, lots of other appraisals in the area for a lot, uh, you know, higher values. We dug into this. It's a good appraiser. Um, C.P. Brayman and company, Emily Brayman did the appraisal. And um, the the reasoning is that that um, you know it, it's it's not a buildable lot per se. It has value to the adjacent property owner, but um, there's there's not a lot of um, uses that could go on that that piece of land currently. I should say too, we are accepting out of there anything that's being used for the right of way. There's a cul-de-sac at the end of that street. Um, so we're accepting out of this sale parcel the right of way, which is why there's a little curve to it. And we've also worked with city planning so that in the future, if we wanted to connect um, West 22nd Street into the West Side Market parking lot, there's no, um, th nothing would block that direct access um, into the West Side Market parking lot. Okay, all right, I wanna open this up for any questions from my colleagues. Uh, Councilman Brian Case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to the director, um, do you know what the developer bought the uh, apartment parcel for? I do not. Uh, I do not have that. I can come back to you on that, but I don't. I don't have that information. If you could get us that, please, before finance. Um, I seem to agree with the chair in that sixty-six hundred dollars for a parcel next to the west side market and the new development doesn't seem like a good deal for us. Thank you. All right, director, did, um, do you have um, the price that the city actually, did the city pay for this in 19, you say 1940? In the 40s? Uh, 19, uh, through, uh, Mr. Chairman, so yeah, 1943, um, I can look up uh, if the deed has that sale price on it. Um, so let me do that as well when I give you the price of the apartment building. Okay, also the, the uh, appraiser has, has, do we use this appraiser uh, quite often? Does the city use this appraiser quite often? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we do. I would say that she's one of the, um, uh, the the good ones, if you will, one of the folks that does a really good job with with her appraisal reports. Okay. 
Okay. All right, seeing no further questions, ordinance number 1212-2022, it stands approved. All right, you, do you have any more pieces, Director? Okay, that's it? All right. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, Director, we're going to see you. Um, we're going to see you after the um, the director comes up and does his presentation. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. All right, Director, we're going to start with uh, resolution number um, 1285 2022 by Council Members McCormick and Bishop and Harrison. Um, this is an emergency ordinance declaring the intent to vacate a portion of the Detroit Superior Viaduct. Okay? You want to talk to this about us? Talk to us about this, Director? Uh, yes, sir. And uh, if, if I may, before we start, I wanted to introduce our new Assistant Director of Capital Projects. Um, Keisha Chambers is to my right. She started in November, November 28th. November 28th. So um, we're really happy to have her in the Capital Projects office. And I'm sure that you all have um, you know, a chance to meet with her as we um, move forward. OK, welcome. Thank you. All right. You are a new face. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, did, I sure not, I was looking at what I, you know, I got over here. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, this uh, ordinance uh, 1285 is for a um, intent to vacate a portion of this, of Detroit Superior Viaduct. Um, in particular, it's it's a little bit confusing unless you look at the maps that we provided. But there's a little stretch of. Um, the, um, so this is where the, the county engineering building is, just on the, um, the east side of 25th Street, um, north of the um, Superior Viaduct, um, um, or Superior Avenue, I should say. And there's a, a very large development that's planned there called Bridgeworks, and that's going to be um, a housing, retail office, and a garage, um, including a hotel. And um, if you can envision the, um, the county engineering building, uh, there's a, a parking lot there that has a, actually has a roadway going through it called Vermont Avenue. Mm -hmm. And so this is to vacate just a piece of what sort of cuts through the development site um, to allow them to square off um, the site. They are um, the owner of all the adjacent property. And this would allow for um, a better um, uh, geometry to their site and also better access in and out of the parking garage. Um, so if you, look at the, if you look at this drawing, which should be on your tablet, this mm -hmm. shows just the little piece of the, of the property that they're looking to vacate to square off the site. And like I said, they own, on, they own both sides of it. Vermont Avenue kind of cuts through the middle of it. So, um, so the vacation is the piece in um, yellow right here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. All right. Is there any questions from my colleagues? All right. Seeing no questions. I, I have a, I have a oh, question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> Councilman Mr. Brian Casey. Mr. Chairman, to the director, can you just explain to those who don't necessarily understand what it means when we're vacating a piece mm -hmm. of property as opposed to our previous piece of legislation where, where we're selling it? Um, through the chairman of the council, and yes, um, so the street vacation process, um, you know, the, the streets are, are what we would call right-of-way, 
And so whenever there's um, um, a situation where we don't need the right of way for public ingress or ingress, then there, there's an opportunity to do what we call a vacation, which would then um, convert essentially all or a portion of the right of way to a public or a private use. So we don't sell right of way um, because typically the underlying fee originally was the, the adjacent property owners. So as you vacate a piece of the right of way or the entire right of way, then generally speaking, that, that land would go half to the a butter on one side and half to the butter on the other side at no cost because the concept is that it was originally their land before it was platted or before it was um, purchased for the for the right of way. Our process is a three step process. This is the intent to vacate. Then we would go through a board of revisions of assessments. Is that right, Eric? <laughs> and then and then we would go through uh, another ordinance to, to complete that vacation process. All right, so the difference in vacating and then selling a piece of property is the right of way. Yes, correct. Exactly. That's we don't sell what we would consider the right of way or a sidewalk or or anything like that. That's right. correct. And then in this piece of legislation, I see here that um, the features, because we know that's the old trolley entrance, the ticket booth, and the streetcar entrance, and all that is going to be preserved in this. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to affect giving up this vacating this portion is not going to affect the historic um, preservation down there, is it? Um, through the chairman of the councilman, correct. They'll still have access to the underside of, of the, the, the trolley level of the bridge and then to the, 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 you know, the entrances that go up to the, um, I'm not sure what restaurants at the top right now, but all that's maintained. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank yep. you, Director. All right, any other questions? Seeing no further questions, ordinance number 1285-2022 is approved. Okay, ordinance number 1201-2022 by council members Spencer, McCormick, Bishop, Harrison, and Griffin. This is a departmental request, an emergency ordinance authorizing the director of capital projects to apply for and accept funding for the rehabilitation of Lorraine Avenue from West 65th Street to West 20th Street, authorizing the director of capital projects to enter into one or more professional services contracts for the design authorized other agreements and authorizing the commissioner of purchasing and supplies to acquire, accept, and record real property and easements. Okay, director. And Mr. Chairman, if, if, uh, if we could, I'll, I'll explain this one a little bit. And then we have a PowerPoint that addresses both this one and, and the next one. Okay. I'll combine in one. Um, but this first one for Lorraine Avenue rehabilitation, um, this is for the project that was um, out in the public originally as the Lorraine Cycle Track. Um, it's, uh, we're, we're kind of rebranding it as um, an extenu extenuation of, extension of the midway um, concept that we have in the other ordinance. Um, but the Lorraine Avenue rehabilitation, this is really to allow us to enter into the design contracts and any associated real estate um, or uh, utility agreements that we would need to, to get into the design. Whereas for the Superior Midway, we're looking for authorization um, to grant consent to ODOT to actually construct the improvement um, and move, move through that entire process because we have the funding set up to, to move forward um, um, with the Superior Avenue cycle track, Superior Midway. Okay, so this is a this is a kind of sister legislation to the one we're going to hear in just a few minutes. Yes. Okay. Um, is there any questions on ordinance number twelve oh one? Do you want to start it? The PowerPoint or yeah. Okay. All right, we'll we'll go to that. All right, let me read ordinance number eleven forty forty twenty twenty two by council members McCormick, House, Bishop, Harrison, and Griffin by departmental request. This is also an emergency ordinance authorizing the Director of Capital Projects to apply uh, to the District 1 Public Works Integrated Committee for state funding for construction, for constructing the Superior Midway Separated Bikeway from Public Square 
East Roadway to East 55th Street, giving consent to the City of Cleveland, to the Director of Transportation for the improvement, to apply for and accept any gifts, grants, for the purpose for any public or private entity authorizing professional services agreements with public and private entities and any relative agreements authorizing the Commissioner of Purchases and Supplies to acquire, accept, and record for right-of-way purposes any real property and easements necessary to make the improvements and causing payment to ODOT of the city share of the improvement. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, we have uh, Annie Pease um, to my far right. She's a project manager in the Division of Real Estate in the Mayor's Office of Capital Projects. And she's going to go through um, a PowerPoint here. We did give an update to the Transportation Subcommittee back in maybe October. Um, and so this would be a continuation of, of uh, you know, getting these two projects off the ground. Okay. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director, for the introduction. Uh, I have a few slides on the Superior Midway Project, so the ordinance that you just read, and then we'll jump back to the Lorraine Midway Project. Okay. I'll start with a little bit of project background, um, the impetus uh, behind the improvement, an overview of what it will include, and our next steps. Uh, so the Superior Midway Project is a pilot. Um, the, there was a planning study in 2017 that looked at City of Cleveland streets and specifically uh, the network of streets across the city that were formerly streetcar lines. These are wider than many of our other streets and the study in 2017 asked the question, how should these streets be used going forward? In the, the 21st century, uh, we have a, a 20th century design and now we have a 21st century user base uh, and so the study explored the question, how should these streets be designed for the future? Uh, the results of that study, uh, is there's a small map on the right uh, that shows a network of midway uh, cycle facilities throughout the city. The superior segment uh, between East Roadway, so just the east side of Public Square, and East 55th Street was selected as the pilot segment uh, to demonstrate what a midway facility looks like on a city of Cleveland street. Uh, the cross section you see on the street here is, hasn't been um, designed in detail yet, but gives you a sense of what the layout of a midway street would look like. You can see on the outside, you have a nice wide sidewalk space, uh, plenty of room for pedestrian activity, uh, two lanes of travel in either direction, again, to accommodate uh, vehicles as well as RTA service sufficiently. Uh, and then in the middle of the street, we have a two-way bicycle facility. Um, so it's um, a very detailed, thoughtful design, really accommodating all users of our streets, car drivers, pedestrians, cyclists, and transit users. Um, this is a map just showing the project extent, again, the east side of Public Square out to East 55th Street. Um, this crosses um, three different wards. It's about two and a half miles of street. And um, those two images on the right are another concept, um, just a, a conceptual rendering. So you can see the um, street lighting, important for safety, pedestrian accommodations, both with the sidewalks as well as well-marked crosswalks throughout the corridor, transit accommodations, and then a landscape buffer separating the cycle track from uh, the vehicular lanes. Um, where we are in the study and the project, again, I mentioned the um, planning study, the citywide study concluded in 2017. And since that time, uh, we've been exploring feasibility for Superior, again, as our pilot segment, looking both at safety and current traffic operations. Do we have sufficient space um, in more detail than what the planning study looked at to accommodate all these different uh, uses? Uh, and in 2023, our intent is to proceed with more detailed design and engineering. Uh, with the intent to start construction for the project in 2025. Um, we've also been fundraising since 2017, and a little bit different from the Lorraine project that we'll talk about next. Um, we do have full uh, construction funding in the way of grants that we've applied for with a lot of support from um, NOACA and CMAC grants uh, to make the improvement. This is a summary of uh, funding for the project, the design portion, 
uh, will cost $2.3 million, and that will be a combination of federal funds, the CMAQ funds, uh, and a, a matching fund through road and bridge bonds. Our construction estimate is uh, $22.7 million, again, with a large federal share uh, in CMAQ funds. Again, that's a federal grant source that NOACA administers with the required 20% uh, local match uh, from city to the tune of four and a half uh, million dollars. Those would be uh, likely road and bridge bonds that have not yet been secured, uh, but that we would anticipate in the future. So that figure, um, to Annie, that figure um, it entails the Superior and the Lorraine project or just one? Uh, superior project. To the chair, this is just for the Superior okay. Midway section. So two and a half miles of roadway. Um, so as I said, uh, our current steps are to proceed uh, in securing our contract uh, with ODOT to advance detailed design between um, quarter one of this year uh, and approximately March of 2025. Um, because we are using federal funds to fund most of this project, uh, we, have a, we are contracting with ODOT um, and they will administer the construction. Uh, we anticipate again between May of 2025 uh, with completion scheduled for fall of 26. And that's the conclusion of my presentation for the superior section. Okay. Um, to the chair, would you like me to proceed yeah, with the Lorraine? Let's go okay. Um, so the, the second project uh, is the Lorraine Midway. Um, previously, this project we had referred to as the Lorraine Avenue Cycle Track Project. Um, I'll provide some background on uh, Lorraine and also articulate next steps. Um, but the Lorraine Midway, so the Lorraine project, we're talking about Lorraine Ave from West 20th Street, which is the west side of the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge, uh, all the way to West 65th Street. This is 1.8 uh, miles of street, and we cross two wards with this project. Similar to um, Superior, Lorraine is also primarily commercial. Uh, with some residential and residential side streets. Uh, Lorraine Ave currently is approximately 66 feet wide through most of its sections. Uh, and again, this was another street that we looked at um, in the 2017 Midway Network Planning Study. Um, and uh, formerly a streetcar uh, street as well, Lorraine Ave was prioritized for a Midway type um, facelift, we could say, going forward. Lots of room for um, vehicles, some sidewalk space, but fairly limited in terms of dedicated transit facilities or um, bicycle facilities. Um, over time, over the last um, just over 10 years, the city has been rehabilitating Lorraine uh, from west to east. And so you can see on this slide, we started on the far west side of Lorraine from the city limit to west 150th Street. That section was improved in 2010. In 2017, from West 150th to 117th, um, there was, were additional streetscape enhancements and bicycle facilities on that section. And just in 2020, um, we did West 117th to West 65th, uh, again, with some minor streetscape enhancements and uh, bicycle facilities, with Lorraine having by that point been identified as an important corridor for bicycle connectivity east-west. So this makes Lorraine Ave between West 20th and West 65th that remaining gap in the rehabilitation of, of Lorraine. Um, I mentioned formerly this project was called the Lorraine Avenue Cycle Track. Uh, that was designated, the na that name was designated during um, a community-based planning process called Living Lorraine, uh, largely led by Ohio City Incorporated and partners at that time. Um, the cycle track concept was prioritized as a streetscape amenity project, uh, a way to improve both traffic and safety along the street, but also add a lot to the retail environment around the street. Um, that study was completed in 2013 um, and was provided as an input into the citywide midway study in 2017. Again, you'll see that map on the right. Lorraine is prioritized for a midway configuration as part of this citywide uh, midway network. So in that way, it relates to the Superior project uh, in its ideation and um, how it serves 
from the user perspective and a, a network connectivity perspective, but it has slightly different origins in that it was originally prioritized from a, a very specific community-based planning process in Living Lorraine. The configuration for the Midway on Lorraine is also a little bit different. The proposed configuration is a little bit different from the superior segment. Uh, for Lorraine, the bicycle facility uh, is recommended to be on the side of the street uh, instead of, as you may recall from the superior presentation, where the bicycle facility is down the middle. Um, given the difference in the width of the street and traffic operations, this was the recommended configuration for Lorraine. Um, this speaks to the idea that the Midway is more of a concept on revitalizing our streets and thinking about them from a different user perspective, but the exact typology needs to be context sensitive relative to the corridors themselves and how uh, traffic and people are moving on those, those facilities. We did, um, in, in looking at the 2017 recommendations for the plan and knowing that this Lorraine segment between West 65th and West 20th uh, was kind of our final section of, of uh, improvements along Lorraine, um, we brought four different concepts uh, to the public in 2021 um, that were sort of a range of ways we could incorporate bicycle facilities along this segment that scaled in intensity and therefore reflected timeliness and cost. So there were some um, lower, um, less intensive bicycle facility recommendations that we, the city, could have acted on a little bit quicker um, without needing to, um, to fundraise to the extent we do for the proposed configuration. Um, four concepts were presented to the public and um, there was a large majority of responses, 69%, indicated a preference for a sidewalk level bicycle facility in the configuration that I showed just a couple slides ago uh, with the two-way bicycle uh, facility on the side of the street um, and, and three lanes of traffic. This does the um, public feedback we received last year does align again with the recommendations of that Living Lorraine uh, study. Um, so our preliminary um, construction cost for uh, the Lorraine Midway is just over $30 million. Um, that is, oh, those are today's dollars, 2023 dollars, and um, to date we have raised um, approximately 14.9, so $15 million, so approximately half of the anticipated project cost. A portion of these funds come through federal sources, both the CMAC, which is the the, also the, the funding source for the Superior Project, um, as well as the transportation alternatives. Uh, those are, are, are two federal sources, um, in large part to NOACA support for the project. Um, we do have 2.3 million in city match for the project, and we have some uh, ODOT paving funds um, to support the project as well. So we have half of the funding raised for what we're anticipating the overall cost will be. Um, I'll go on right on to next steps because it relates very closely. Um, in order to be competitive for uh, additional uh, public funding and grants for this project, um, if we proceed with preliminary engineering and more feasibility to demonstrate that this concept will work uh, and we get the design going, we'll be a better candidate for major grant applications to fill the remaining funding gap uh, we have on the project. Uh, so our plan and what the legislation would authorize us to do is to begin preliminary engineering and the envir environmental work uh, we need. Um, we'd like to begin and issue an RFP uh, early this year in 2023, begin the preliminary design this year to wrap up in 2024. Between 2024 and 2025, we could more aggressively submit grant applications to fill the remaining gap. Uh, and really based on when we close, the funding gap would dictate the rest of our uh, detailed design and construction timeline for this project. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so let me get this straight. The, the Lorraine um, um, portion is from, what's the stretch of the Lorraine portion again? It will go from, uh, to the chair, West 20th to West 65th Street. Okay. Um, and then the superior portion will go from Public Square to East 55th Street. 
That's correct. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I'm going to go to Brian Councilman Brian Mooney. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> to the chair, can you go back to that photograph of the West 20th to West 65th, where you have the design of the sidewalk, the bike lane, and all that? Oh, that you yep. there it is. So I'm, I'm looking at this. Now, with the other one, it's clear there's a buffer and, and the bicycles are in the middle. Is this essentially just going to be an extra wide sidewalk, or is there going to be a buffer between the, the pedestrian sidewalk and the cycle track? How, how is that? Or is, you know, that's what I'm, I'm just curious conceptually. What's the idea? <clears throat> sure. So through the chair to the councilman. Um, for this configuration, the bicycle traffic would be at the same level as, as the sidewalk. There are, there's design guidance that we follow in designing the facility to demarcate um, a bike facility from the sidewalk space. Um, there has been conversation around distinguishing a cycle track from a multi-purpose path. A cycle track is a dedicated space just for cyclists, and a multi-purpose path accommodates both cyclists and pedestrians. An example of a multi-purpose path on a, in a configuration like this would be along the Opportunity Corridor, where you have a sidewalk space, and then you have a two-way bicycle facility, but pedestrians and bicyclists can both use it. Um, it's on the same level, but we do need to um, delineate. There are some design distinctions to um, either with a small curb or um, a texture to separate the bicycle facility from the sidewalk. So okay, there are so visual cues. Sure. So you're, you're not sure what, but it could be a little curb to separate or markings or a different type of a surface. So essentially, it looks like what we're doing on Lorraine, or this portion, is taking away a, a, a lane of parking and then rededicating that to the bike lane. Is that essentially with the reallocation of the space or are the sidewalks going to be the same? Are the sidewalks going to be roughly the same dimensions? Just the sidewalk portion. That's a two-part question. <laughs> sure. From the chair to the councilman. So we don't know the exact um, dimensions of the sidewalk yet and how they may differ from the widths today. That's a question that we'll explore more in the detail of design and engineering. Um, to the question of the configuration of the bicycle facility and on-street parking. Today, through most of this section, it varies depending on exactly where you are, but mostly between West 20th and West 65th, there's parking both on the north and the south side of the street. With the Lorraine Midway project, parking would remain on one side of the street, and there would be a dedicated the bicycle facility. Um, currently, it's proposed on the north side of the street through the extent of the project. And just a question to follow up. I know this went through some review. This is still conceptual. But, you know, I mean, I know Lorraine mostly, you know, all of Lorraine from, from West 20th to, to, uh, to Fairview Park, that's mostly commercial. So how do, the commercial, how do the commercial businesses feel about losing half their parking? From the chair to the councilman, um, much of those discussions have happened with the Living Lorraine um, process, the planning process in 2013, and then again when the city reissued those four options that showed a range of bicycle facilities and their impacts on, on parking. Through those engagement processes, we heard from lots of different people, um, but many folks have been in support of the bicycle facility. When the city would advance preliminary design and engineering, it would open up the door again to have that conversation and better understand some of the concerns around access um, and do more detailed analysis on parking counts and understand where we have pinch points and where we're able to make accommodations elsewhere. Okay, but, but it sounds like a lot of it's just been with the residents, not just specifically with the businesses that will be impacted. Um, from the chair to the councilman, the engagement to date has been both with residents and businesses along the corridor. Right, right, right. But I mean, so are the businesses okay with losing half their parking? That's the question. Or do you not know? From the chair to the councilman, um, we could go back and do a little more digging on what those, some of the, more detailed on what the engagement indicated. Um, but we'll learn a lot more as we advance preliminary sure. engineering. No, thank you. For, that's all my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilman Mooney. So on this drawing, where is the um, landscape? Do we have any landscape pr proposed for this? Uh, so to the chair, we do have, uh, for the Lorraine Midway, there will be a buffer between the bicycle facility and um, the road, so whether it's a parking lane or a vehicular travel lane. 
Um, and that buffer space would be an opportunity to incorporate landscaping. We haven't gone into the details of what that landscaping would look like. Um, but in some of the renderings we have for this project, that's where there would be more green elements along the street. Okay. So that, that buffer, how, how wide is that buffer? Do you have a dimension on that? Uh, that accommodate a tree is my, next, is my question. To the chair, um, I don't have the dimension on the buffer right now. That would be something we'd look more carefully at in preliminary engineering. Um, and at that point, we would be able to uh, prioritize for landscape type. Okay. All right, is there any other questions from my colleagues? Mr. Chair. Councilman, <clears throat> Councilman Brian Mooney. I mean, not Brian Mooney, uh, Brian Case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, can we put up the, the Superior, that picture of the but with Superior? Because I just want to have the converse, kind of piggyback in on Councilman Mooney. Um, and then that is we have no parking along that strip at all. Um, is, is there, Mr. Chairman, to, I don't want to call it. Do you have a title? I, I'm a, from the chair to the councilman, project coordinator. Okay, to the project coordinator. Uh, is there currently parking from Public Square to East 55th on Superior? From the chair to the councilman, um, there is parking along certain portions of Superior. Uh, it's not the whole way, um, but there is on-street parking. And I would clarify the intent of our project isn't to eliminate on-street parking where it exists today. Um, but we would be looking at it carefully uh, with where we have areas of safety hotspots and we want to ensure we're making pedestrian accommodations. Um, it's not to guarantee that all the on-street parking that's there today would remain in the future, but our intent is not to eliminate on-street parking where it exists. And then just as an overall for both projects, um, especially Lorraine, which is so commercial heavy, um, Mr. Chairman, to uh, our presenters here today, um, I don't, I can't, I'm trying to think of, but I can't off the top of my head visualize any place, unlike when Detroit Avenue was redone, where there was spaces for public parking lots that fit into an urban landscape, right, along, along Detroit Avenue where there are certain parking lots that are used. Is there anything like that available along Lorraine? Or just to keep in the back of your mind, I know this is early concept, is there anything like that available along Lorraine for public parking as well as uh, the, the, the Superior Midway Project or whatever you're calling it? Through the chair to the councilman, I know that in the Living Lorraine planning study, we'd have to go back and see what types of recommendations were made and again, how things have changed between 2013 and present day. Um, but certainly I know there have been conversations at the planning level, both with the Community Development Corporation there and uh, city planning on our end on how we can better consolidate or accommodate <laughs> shared parking opportunities along the corridor. This is a really good example of where destinations are really close together. And so having the more efficient use of space, identifying those opportunities early on would be really helpful. And then um, uh, my second question is, Mr. Chairman, to our presenters. The buffers. I, it looks like in in the superior design, are those elevated buffers uh, where the trees are in the middle? Or, do you know what I'm saying? Is there something there? Because I noticed in the Lorraine one, it doesn't look like the buffer is elevated, right? So it looks like it goes sidewalk, cycle lane, maybe a small drop. Uh, for a buffer, are we're not. Are we when you when you're talking buffer on Lorraine? Are you talking? something that would physically stop a cyclist or a car from interacting with one another, or is it just a painted green line that's maybe two or three feet wide that we've seen around the city? So from the chair to the councilman, for Lorraine, the sidewalk and the bicycle facility and the buffer would be at the same level, okay. and then you'd have the curb going down to the street. Okay. So we haven't um, detailed what the materiality of the buffer would look like yet, but it could be something like a tree lawn, so it turns to grass and then there's a curb, um, or it could be a different color concrete or, or something just to demarcate a separate space, and you could have trees or planters or some type of additional vertical separation. Um, and for the superior project, um, the curb would be between the outer edge of the buffer and the vehicular travel lanes. 
And um, we're still looking in detail as to the elevation of the bicycle facility itself, whether it would be lower, so you'd have another curb between the bicycle facility and the, the tree lawn or, or buffer, um, or if it would be at the same level. Uh, we're still exploring that in the design, but we're working with Public Works and really keeping maintenance and how we can ensure we're keeping that path clear of um, ice and debris um, as efficiently as possible. All right, and then who is responsible then if this if we have something like this in the middle lanes with the bicycles and stuff like that um, for bicycle lanes who, would that would public works be responsible for ma maintaining clearing that during the winter months um, seeing how that's in between two travel lanes um, and then how would how would I mean, I know I'm probably going further down the line than, than the project is, but I just want to make sure that you guys are working with Public Works as well. Does that need to be cleared? Should it be cleared? Is it going to be Public Works? You're, obviously, you're not going to be able to get a, a snow plow down the middle of a bicycle lane. You know, what would be the sense of having something like that if it can't be cleared in the winter months? Or we know how the snow plows go, right? You don't plow straight down, you have to plow at an angle. Are they gonna plow into the bicycle lanes? Do we, I, I mean, there's just, I'm just throwing it out there for something to be thought of later on down the line in case this comes back and we don't, I don't think about something like that later. From the chair to the councilman, we appreciate those comments. Um, they're relevant and timely. Um, to the first part of your question, um, the bicycle facility will be located in the public right-of-way, so short of having a separate maintenance agreement, it would be the responsibility of the city for regular maintenance, including winter maintenance. Um, we're actively in discussions with Public Works about our opportunities to best do that, given that projects like um, Lorraine and Superior, um, Thrive 105, 93, and other trail and bikeway projects will have similar elements and have been um, priorities that we've heard over and over from the community that they'd really like us to advance. Um, but we are discussing with Public Works as to the best opportunities and what we really need from a resource perspective to be able to maintain over the long term um, and keep the, this infrastructure usable, not just in the months where it's sunny and 80 degrees, right. but throughout more of the year as well. And then one last question, Mr. Chairman, to the, to the director maybe probably, or, or Ann. Is spending $25 million to reconfigure the street to put in uh, bicycle lanes, do we have enough bicycle users? I gotta be careful because Bike Cleveland beat me up one time over asking a question like this, but it, is it worth the investment for the number of cyclists that we have in the city of Cleveland? I mean, you, you, that's a great I mean, question yeah. from yeah. Um, through the councilman, through the chair to the councilman. Um, in looking at our bicycle infrastructure across the city, there's a lot of research that indicates that when you build out a network that accommodates cyclists of all ages and abilities, so not just the person who bikes every day and wears Lycra and um, will bike through right. negative 20 or 80 degrees, but when you build out infrastructure that accommodates someone who's eight or someone who's 80, that the facilities are used and that your ridership goes up. Okay. There's also positive impacts on transit ridership and having facilities like that. Um, so our vision and really what the 2017 planning study looked at was that Lorraine and Superior are important spines where we have some bicycle infrastructure now in the city of Cleveland. We have some of this, but it's sporadic and it's not connected. And we really need to build out our spines our major arteries in the spine of the network to make these major connections. And while there are cyclists today and um, our racks here in City Hall are nearly full most days, um, we would we anticipate seeing the ridership grow over okay. time. All right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Councilman Casey. Uh, Councilman Anthony Harrison. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just briefly, so you, you went through the project costs for Lorraine and Superior and uh, through the chair the director and, and uh, project coordinator. The Lorraine project is uh, sh a shorter distance uh, than Superior project, which is what you say, 1.8 miles total, right? 
Mm -hmm. And that cost is estimated to be about 30 plus million dollars. Superior is over two miles, but almost three miles rather, and it's coming in at $25 million. Through the chair to the uh, Public Works Department, can you share with me the, uh, the difference between uh, the project cost for each? Are the elements of one that one is not receiving? Um, just trying to get understanding of, uh, of both. Through the chair. Do you have a sense of that? Sure. So through the chair to the councilman, um, m much of the difference in those percentage differences while the corridor is longer on Superior, um, Lorraine has, um, because it's a narrower right of way, some of the utilities there are closer together and um, there's a lot in a smaller amount of space that we have to explore and, mm. and detail really carefully. Um, the other aspect of Lorraine that we're exploring, the $30 million uh, cost assumption includes um, an extensive repair of the under part of the street. With Superior, we're a little bit farther along in understanding what precisely needs to be repaired. So that $25 million we've really honed over time and fundraised. The so $30 million for Lorraine is, we're not quite as far along. So it's a conservative estimate for what it could cost. As we proceed with preliminary uh, engineering on the project, mm -hmm. we'll have a better sense of whether the subsurface below the street, the extent of those repairs. And there's a possibility that in the future that cost could come down if the under the road repairs aren't as extensive as we're estimating today. Yep. Thank you. Through the chair to, uh, to uh, Capital Projects team. So you have completed the preliminary engineering for Superior uh, that has told you the, the underlying, the, which, whatever you just call this, sub, um, sub base of the, of the street is in a good enough condition where you don't need to do extensive uh, work there to stabilize the, 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 the road for the project. Is that correct? Do the chair. So, the feasibility study, right? Yeah, through the chair to the councilman. We have um, feasibility studies for Superior. Um, we don't have extensive geotechnical work, hmm. but from the information we have so far, um, we don't have major concerns. But as we begin the detailed design and engineering, we'll learn more for Superior. And, and through the chairman and the councilman, so some of our knowledge about what might be the case on Lorraine is because um, as we demonstrated, we've already done pieces of Lorraine um, from the west heading, heading east. And through those projects, we've discovered that um, because of how the trolley system was set up, that there, it sort of has an impact on the roadway itself. And since we've already done pieces of Lorraine Avenue, um, that's why we think we might be able to have some cost savings. Um, not to say that there might not be cost savings on Superior, but we don't have, um, you know, chunks of Superior already, you know, completed that we can use that data um, for our planning. <clears throat> sure. Thank you, uh, uh, Director. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And lastly, uh, as my colleague indicated, you know, parking along these corridors are, are very, 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 very important, right? If once you get on Superior and you pass between uh, 30th and um, between 30th and I w I'll say kind of 36th there, you have a lot of, uh, of heavy industry uh, that lines Superior there. Um, uh, a, a semi truck repair shop you have, automotive you have, uh, other manufacturers you have, uh, shipping, receiving facilities there. And so that stretches a period very heavily utilized um, with Orange Street parking. And then once you cross, oh, you cross the, um, under the bridge heading towards East 40th Street, that's where you get your more, your more light industry, your auto, a lot of automotive, automotive repairs, body shops, you have barber shops, you have Luther Metropolitan, you have ice cream parlors. I mean, you have a lot of um, uh, folks that use that, all, that Orange Street uh, parking. And, you know, I hope that, you know, we don't take that away. You know, that is one of the concerns that businesses on Superior have reached out to me and have indicated after you all held your virtual meeting 
uh, that they are very concerned about losing the parking for themselves and for, for, for their staff, but also for the patrons who come and uh, frequent their business. And so, you know, those, those stretches of, of Superior are very important that um, we maintain that uh, on-street uh, parking along uh, Superior, all right? And, and lastly, Mr. Chair, you know, I'll talk to the department uh, again about directly about this, but, you know, we want to, I know you did your virtual meeting, but we need something more intimate uh, for the businesses and the residents who live in, in this, at least the stretch of War 10 uh, on Superior uh, to engage them about the midway. You know, when we, when Sharonda was here from planning, we had planned a meeting, but that's right when COVID had began and, and yeah. we didn't, we didn't have that, that in-person meeting. And this was at a pause in terms of community engagement. And then you all came back uh, this last year with the virtual uh, meetings, but we really need to residents want to engage face-to-face uh, -face and intimately with uh, the department. Uh, and so we can work with you all to make sure that that happens. So the residents have opportunity to uh, share concerns or ideas uh, as you all are still working through your, your design. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Councilman Harrison. Um, so, uh, Director, this uh, piece of legislation is going to go to DPS. Uh, um, Mr. Chairman, it does go to DPS, yes. and um, I, I will say that um, for the for the Superior project, um, we would appreciate Council's assistance in you know keeping it moving because we are um, ODOT has been asking us to um, to enter into the agreements that they're they're seeking. So we have three committees. So. You know, hopefully by the end of the month, we'll get through all three committees. Okay. All right. Is there any other questions on ordinance number 1201-2022 or ordinance number 11-4-2022? All right. Seeing no further questions, ordinance number uh, 1201 and ordinance number 1144 is, is approved. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Director. Can we have uh, Public Works back to the table? Thank you. Dream. All right, Director, sorry about the musical chairs here. We. Uh, um, so, Director, we uh, we wanted to get an update on the um, how things are going with the snowplow um, and um, some of the enhancements that we have uh, made um, over the course of the last year and a half about the uh, snowplow trackers. Uh, can you talk to us about that uh, situation? Through the chair to the council. Uh, Thank you for having us today. First off, I would just like to say that I was extremely encouraged by uh, the staff's response, especially during a holiday uh, weekend. Uh, staff, whether it be from waste, streets, parking, uh, parks, uh, everyone showed up. Uh, and for the most part, we, we had a great response, uh, especially during the holiday. So that was a, a, a very encouraging uh, portion for the uh, snow and ice control event that we had. Uh, also, I would uh, make mention of the fact that this weather event was uh, came in with uh, quite a few different variables, whether it be rain, sleet, ice, snow. So we were definitely, uh, it was kind of the perfect storm, if, if, you, rec if you would uh, say, when you consider uh, the event that was coming in versus uh, the holiday and those uh, anomalies that come with that. So I, I was very encouraged with staff's response uh, with that. Uh, we do not have necessarily a um, presentation as nothing has changed uh, from the last one, but what we were going to do is go through the questions that you had in the agenda and uh, answer those, and uh, some of those are uh, based on those that you mentioned. Uh, also, I'd like to just make mention of, I have here with me uh, Commissioner Randy Scott uh, from the Division of Streets, uh, John Laird, uh, Assistant Director of Public Works. In the back, I also have uh, Commissioner Jeff Brown uh, from MVM. His group did a wonderful job keeping equipment up. Uh, I think that we only had throughout the event only about four, four to six units down at any one time, which was uh, remarkable for the staffing, especially when you consider the weather. Uh, uh, also, we have uh, our project manager from our uh, 
route optimization project. Uh, Shekana Merritt is back there. Uh, also, uh, see, I'm sorry. Oh, Monique Graves, who is our district unit leader for the 65th station, but she is also our head trainer. Uh, we have uh, we wanted to really focus on training this summer, as I mentioned in our last time we were at the table. We were really focused on training this summer, and she headed up uh, the training uh, for our group. Uh, also, Eric Turk from the Weld Shop. Uh, he's a general shop foreman. He is here. Uh, he's helping us with our uh, implementation of some of the new piloting programs that we're using for blades and also different materials. Uh, so I wanted you all to meet him. Uh, and also Assistant Director uh, Shelton Coleman from the Division of Streets is here uh, as well. I wanted you to uh, meet him as well. Uh, so just again, update on the number of drivers and how many new trainees. Uh, I'll let uh, Randy speak to that. Well, different from last year, uh, Mr. Chairman, we added additional uh, seasonal staffing uh, and drivers to our roster. So last year we had 94. This year we're shooting for 120. Currently we're somewhere around 113 and we're still onboarding uh, the last seven individuals and we'll continue to do so at least to the end of this month. But there has been a, there, there's a 20 driver, 26 driver increase from last year to this year. That will give us the ability to staff a full second shift as opposed to a half crew on second shift. We have a full second shift and that will relieve some of the tension and overtime um, from the drivers on first and third. Just, just to piggyback on that statement, this is also not only from an efficiency standpoint, but from a safety perspective. Uh, having those 26 extra drivers reduces the length of shifts that uh, some of our staff has to run when we get into those 12, 14, and 16 hour events. We can uh, definitely use, utilize those extra bodies to make sure that the staff can get the amount of rest that is necessary to get uh, for the service of, of the roadways. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, sec the next question was update on the condition of vehicles and how many are in circulation. I'll let uh, Commissioner Brown speak to that. Uh, to the chair, to the council speaking. Um, we have a total of, of 60 active snow plows in our fleet right now um, on a daily basis as the director uh, mentioned. During the storm, we were averaging anywhere from four to six out of service. Uh, during the storm, we ran a 24-hour shift, maintenance shift, uh, and uh, continue to maintain those plows throughout the storm. Uh, just to uh, expound on that, uh, in my experience, I think uh, Commissioner Scott probably could speak to it as well. That is remarkable uh, for an MVM group to be able to keep that many pieces of equipment up, especially uh, when we expect uh, quite a few hydraulic issues when you're talking about temperatures dropping in, in as fast as they did. Uh, we, we talked about using vehicles from other departments. I'll let uh, Director Laird speak to how those charges, those interdepartmental charges may or may not be uh, when we use equipment from other, other uh, departments. Good morning. Um, as far as the, uh, the uh, to the chair, as far as the charges go for, and I wanna make sure that I understand that question as far as uh, how it is charged. Are you talking about, I think this is, was this based on the question you had before? Well, was, well we, uh, we, we talked about in the last presentation about <coughs> when we are overwhelmed with the large uh, storm, how we uh, can utilize other vehicles from other departments to help out with the, help streets departments out. And I think that's what he's, what he's talking about. That's what we. So I can say this in the past that we have not charged and when in the case of an emergency, when those things happen like that, if this was something that was not considered an emergency, then we would probably just do them something like a regular JVA kind of charge. I've done this before where we they've done something for us and we charge them back later on throughout the year, throughout from, from our budget cycle. But it just depends on what type of event it is. Okay. So are those, uh, so thank goodness that we didn't get the brunt of the storm that Buffalo, I mean, Buffalo on the other side of Lake Erie. I mean, they were hit uh, way, way harder than what Cleveland was hit. So in the, in the event that we would have received the type of snowfall that Buffalo received, were those vehicles uh, ready to be utilized um, at, at our command? Yes, we did. We, uh, we did have coordination with the uh, Department of Public Utilities. And so they actually do have, they were also outfitted with the Rubicon pieces as well for the snow tracking. 
So we, we did have, and I'm not quite sure, I think it was about maybe um, 10 or so, maybe more vehicles that we have ready to use. But at this time, we, we didn't need them because uh, our fleet was ready to go. Staff okay. Ready to go. Okay. Also, what I want to ask about is the um, pre-salting uh, of the roadways. Uh, I think it was one weekend. Uh, we had a Saturday where it was really, really icy uh, on one Saturday morning. Uh, and we were, uh, in my neighborhood at least, we were a little bit late as far, and I got quite a few calls about the streets being so icy. Are we doing some kind of pre-treatments when we have icy conditions? It's been our practice in, in this year to uh, be more active in terms of pre-salting. In fact, in this storm, we not only pre-salted the mains, but we pre-salted the residentials. And uh, that, that's something that we're uh, experimenting with now to see what the value of that is. And it proved to be quite valuable. So uh, it, it allowed the public to see that we were prepared, we were out there, we were ready. Uh, of course, when snow melts and or ice melts, it tends to refreeze. So sometimes they have to be retreated again. But in this case, we pre the main, the residential, the mains and the residentials ahead of the storm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question was, uh, will the administration begin to use a snow plow tracker again? What is being done to revamp the tool? The answer to that, uh, Chairman, and to the Council is yes, we are working uh, diligently behind the scenes uh, testing. We have a meeting today at, uh, with uh, Urban AI and IT to kind of see how everything went over the weekend, and we'll be uh, working on that uh, behind the scenes. The technical portions don't impact the operational sides of things, so we'll, we'll keep continuing along until uh, the things that are technical are right and then we will unveil those uh, we do have a, a few more steps that we have left before we uh, before I would recommend uh, to the administration that we should go active with everything just making sure everything is right and it will uh, display everything to the public from a visualization perspective accurately okay direct let me just so, so for, for be clear is the snowplow tracker is it operational at this point in time I will find out this afternoon uh, when we meet with uh, Urban AI and the IT department. There are certain parts of the project that are beyond the public works uh, focus or scope. Uh, some of those things are technical that are happening in IT and also in the Urban AI group. So we're meeting with them after, to see what their findings were from the testing that they performed uh, during the last event. Okay. So no, it's not operational at this point in time, what I'm assuming. I'm assuming that it is operational. We're just looking for the findings of the testing that we performed. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm hoping, I'm optimistic that everything is working out well. Okay, because we even got, we, I guess we got a call that the, the system was not operational during the last storm. Actually, the, I wouldn't use that term. I would say the, the system isn't public yet. Uh, we're, we're actually testing the, the uh, system, the new system now. Okay. So, that, so I wouldn't I wouldn't lean toward saying that anything is unoperational. We are testing right now. Okay. So uh, let me just get some clarity on this. Um, the part of the uh, optimization route optimization that the public can view. Um, we we uh, we went through that with the last storm. Correct. That part. Are you talking about that part? Are you talking about the driver route uh, where they have the the uh, software in the trucks, and the, and the drivers can actually be routed to what streets to plow in a in a in a in a, in a fashion that's organized. Thank you for your question. Uh, that that does help a lot to uh, bring some light to what this project totally is. So there's three components. There's the one component that is the public facing uh, public tracker to where you can see where trucks have passed. That's uh, what I was talking about is we're going to be meeting today to see how everything worked with that and to see if it's ready to go public yet. Uh, the other portions as it relates to uh, the maps going digital and into NCAD devices. That has been being tested, and we've been working through that through the last two events uh, with the tablets and devices going to the routes and things of that sort. Uh, then we actually had the route optimization and route balancing. That portion takes uh, most of the season because uh, there's a, a back and forth with that topic where uh, as the, the vendor uh, balances and, and optimizes the routes, they go back to the drivers to test them, and then the drivers 
drivers because we don't want to take the expertise out of the driver's hands. Mm -hmm. So every time we optimize and balance a route, it goes back to the drivers to test, and then it'll go back to the vendors for the you know, thumbs up or thumbs down or whatever issues that there may be. So the optimization and the balancing portion will last throughout the season. The uh, public facing snow tracker should be unveiled soon as uh, it's ready. And the actual maps on digital devices is actually happening now uh, with the drivers and in the NCAT devices. Okay. Okay. I hope that helps. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, the, are the polycarbon blades being used on all snow plows? No, at this time they are being tested on several uh, trucks throughout the, uh, the fleet. Uh, right now, uh, I'm a big fan of them uh, from my usage in another city, so right now we're testing them with the drivers, getting their feedback. Uh, it's not my practice to just drop something on my staff. I like to let them test it and find a, an affinity for it. Uh, right now, they seem to like them so far, so we're actually uh, looking at the possibility, I think, of outfitting the tandem fleet. Yeah, another 33. Another 33 units with uh, mm. those uh, plow, plow blades. Okay, yeah, I, uh, I, I did see one of those. Uh, that's the blades that's, that's painted. No, well, those are uh, the painted plows were just a uh, conjunction with the rec centers where we let them paint plows. Okay, all right, I, I saw some painted plows. Okay, mm -hmm. great, all right. great, great, great. Uh, salt brine being used as a road pretreatments. Uh, yes, but it depends on the circumstances. Uh, salt brine is a usage, uh, one of the tools that we have uh, in our uh, fleet to be able to use. Uh, this event didn't uh, necessarily uh, present itself uh, it, with the best circumstances to use it because of the rain that was proceeding. Uh, so what we did in that pre-salting uh, is if, if, if effectually makes a salt brine by putting the salt down and letting the rain kind of activate the salt and keep the ice from bonding to the pavement. So we just use a different approach to make brine. Uh, it'll be my goal over the next several seasons to increase our brine usage throughout the city uh, uh, exponentially. Uh, are drivers using new optimized routes? Uh, that goes back to what I was mentioning before. That'll be a process that goes on uh, throughout the season uh, as far as the optimizing and also the balancing of the routes. The, the, I think the big thing uh, that I think council will appreciate most is once we do have the routes balanced because we will have a better understanding of how long it takes to do certain things that we do once we can have the routes balanced across the city. Okay. All right. I want to open this up to questions from my colleagues. Uh, I want to go first to the uh, co-chair, co uh, Brian, Councilman Brian Mooney. It's, and this is just a <clears throat> quick question. I think, you know, just want to make sure I know this is through the chair director, Scott. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, I had a, 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 just a question about utility cuts because it wasn't the city's fault, I mean, per se, but there was a utility cut in my street where there was a plate and that, it wasn't the city, but water pollution control didn't have any cones out there. So when the plow came down the street, hit the metal plate, which it, it cracked the driveway and a curb and it flew up and, and it was taken care of. But my, my question was, is, is it the, I mean, do we, should we use those type of plates in the winter? Or is it just something, maybe it was just an oversight to not have the orange cones? I was just curious. And it's not the city's mm. fault, it's the plow's fault. Well, well. Mr. Chairman, to the councilman, prior to this winter, we put out a memo to all public and private utilities to either remove or countersink the steel plates so the plows would slide over them. Uh, that means they have to cut the utility cut a little wider and drop the plate inside. That helps our drivers significantly. There are occasions where you have an emergency repair and they have to put the plate down. That should come with some form of a cone or something to kind of let the drivers know that they're there. In addition to that, we have our drivers during their practice runs, dry runs, part of that exercise is to go out and identify steel plate locations and mark them down and share them with the drivers on all three shifts. So we keep a running list of steel plate locations so that our drivers are aware that they're there. On occasion when they get snow covered and they're not delineated, absolutely, they can be pushed off the hole. All right. So mm -hmm. just, just to be clear, so there's not one set policy, it's fluid. It's it's if you have to have a, a a cover metal plate for the utility cut, it should be countersunk. Yes. Or 
if, at least marked if it can't be countersunk. Correct. So, mm -hmm. uh, but th th like I said, this was the first storm, and there would have been no way uh, to know that it was even there because there were no cones, and it mm -hmm. wasn't. But the residents were concerned, and I just was was uh, curious. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Councilman Mooney. Um, one one other question I have is, uh, how did it, uh, Commissioner? How did it work out with the uh, new speed tables? Were, were, the, were the drivers able to? to navigate properly around the speed tables? Uh, Mr. Chairman, for the most part, I believe this, uh, the drivers were able to navigate over the speed tables carefully. Uh, I did see, I did talk to the traffic engineering commissioner. There might have been one or two that had some minor damage, uh, and he's taking, he's taking care of that as we speak. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to go to uh, Councilman um, Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to the director, if we could kind of shift off of that and um, go to recycling for a second. There have been a number of videos posted online of um, our waste collectors taking the recycling and dumping that in with the regular trash. Even as of 9.57 this morning, I received an email. Rumors are flying that the recycling project in Cleveland is no more. Any truth to that? Should we continue separating recycling items from normal garbage? So there's a perception out there because there's videos of our trash collectors collecting the recycling and the um, regular trash, putting it in the same ones. And even the the videos that I've researched have the recycling stickers on them. You know, everybody's done what they need to do. Can you address the recycling situation in the city of Cleveland and how we are we going to change this perception that's starting to form out there that, yes, we still are recycling in the city of Cleveland? Through the chair to the councilman, thank you for your question. I know that uh, we're focused on snow and ice control, but this is a, a daily occurrence that we are working on. Uh, I do know that on December 23rd, when we went into those frigid temperatures, we did have some issues with recycling and ended up making a call to in order for safety and to get folk off of the street, we ended up uh, kind of pushing fast forward. And on that day, you may have seen a uh, commingling. Outside of that day, I am not aware of any commingling that was done purposely, so I'll, I'll have to look into that. But there are no changes to our recycling program. As a matter of fact, uh, we've been getting good reports back as it relates to the commingling uh, overall from our program, and we're hoping to continue to increase it as, as we're able. One thing we are working on in first quarter, I have assigned uh, some uh, some sustainability staff that I've moved into my office to work on uh, this topic and some other uh, recycling items. One of the things is to better delineate the trucks for recycling. Uh, but again, I do know that when we went into that inclement weather, we had we started having some equipment issues. We started thinking about safety as it relates to staff walking, uh, and it's slowing everybody down. And we did make some calls and decided to enter enter co-mingle the, the uh, uh, trash on that day. And then, Mr. Chairman, to the director, I can, I can understand and appreciate that. When that happens, though, um, is there any way we can put out some sort of notice, right? Because it only takes one driver to co-mingle one thing, even if they're supposed to because of safety issues or weather issues or something. If we could put something out to say, listen, we're not pickling up recycling this week or hold your recycling back or something or let us know because all these videos that are going online could be from that event, right? It's just there's 30 different people, right. you know, putting these videos out, right? Um, and then they're saying, hey, look, even though it could have been an event, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman to the director, that we're, yes, commingling this week, maybe we just don't pick up recycling that week or we got to let people know what we're doing so that the perception doesn't start becoming, hey, look, we're not recycling anymore. Even up 10 o'clock this morning, right? I'm still getting emails regarding should we continue to recycle, you know? So uh, whatever we got to do, I'm sure this side of the table will help you get the word out when that happens, you know? Um, but there's starting to be the perception that we're not recycling anymore in the city of Cleveland. So we just need to make sure that we put something out or we let people know that, yes, if you could come up with a brief statement, a flyer, something that we can help put out on social media as well 
to let people know, yes, continue to recycle. This is what we're doing. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councilman Casey. Uh, Councilman Richard Starr. Thank you, um, Chair and everyone, my colleagues. Um, Happy New Year. This is, Year, you know, it's a great, exciting um, opportunity to get back to work. But some of the things I do want to commend uh, from just the recycling, um, I know myself and Councilwoman uh, Rebecca are always getting these tags about the illegal dumping that happens in um, places that are becoming a nuisance that are not occupied or boarded up. We're getting a lot of that over on um, the St. Hyacinth, Sopic Village, Broadway neighborhood, as well as other parts in the city. Um, but my question that I definitely would like to talk about was the snow that just happened this past um, break. I want to commend and give a, um, a round of applause to the work and the efforts that you and your team has done. Uh, one of the things that I did notice and I was talking to some of my colleagues was when I was driving around the city, um, right before we knew the storm was coming, that Wednesday, that Thursday, I seen a lot of trucks in War 5. And I was just amazed to see that the trucks was out there. But what we didn't understand was that we was going to get these negative temperatures that was not that was not part of the plan of solving, you know, the snowplow. But what I could remember is residents was calling and not complaining, saying that their street wasn't snowplow. Some of them was calling and saying my street snow was snowplow this time. And I just thought to myself that it was really, really great to see that on the um, proactive side that you did, and also understanding that um, we got work to do. I definitely will be connecting with you, commissioner and director. Um, the chair to make sure that you know I like to like to get inside and be able to understand what the church does um, one thing I did last year when I first got in office around this time um, commissioner was able to allow me to go with a driver and learn that it ain't just driving an f-150 truck <laughs> you really got to use the leverage you use you got to um, use some um, labor power and some manpower in order to operate the truck but then also to make sure that plow get down and hit the right parts and then you also notice that residents are parking on street sometimes where they shouldn't be on that side of the street due to the fact that we have a snowstorm. So it's so type of things that we can do on both sides to get better and I think modernizing the way we snowplow um, through the chair to the um, table is something that is, is moving in the right direction. I look forward to working um, as a member of this body to help support you in any way that we possibly can. But I definitely want to say bravo on the efforts and the work that your team did um, this past break. Yeah, chair. All right, thank you, Councilman Starr. Uh, Councilwoman Rebecca Murray. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and I'll be I'll be brief. I know um, I, I need to like build up my tolerance for longer committee hearings now that we're back from back from the new year. Uh, I'll, and it's great to follow you, Councilman Stark, because I have very similar feedback from my residents. We got a number of calls and emails from folks who are in, especially cul-de-sacs and courts, um, noise court um, at OYES and West 11th, back in my Tremont area, uh, jumps to mind. Folks who reached out to me and said, honestly, we've never had someone be back here on the first pass. And it, it always takes, because we're this like hidden little area, it always takes extra passes to get back here and we were plowed or salted the first time. So we got multiple calls like that and so uh, to the extent that that is both the GPS um, and of course Mrs. Graves helping to implement that, I just wanted to say props to, to you guys because we did get a number of calls about that. Um, one of the pieces of feedback that we also got was that on some of our cul-de-sacs, um, folks felt like, hey, they could have plowed closer to the curb because we're having to get through a lot of ice. And I wondered if it would be good advice for us to give to residents to put up those snow markers to better show where the curb is uh, through the chair. Is that good advice to give to residents that if there is a unusual cut to the street, if there's snowfall expected, that uh, snow markers are helpful? Through the chair to the councilwoman. Uh, yes, those are very helpful. And I would just say that the department will keep getting better. Uh, cul-de-sacs are always just a tough dynamic for uh, snowplow drivers, especially newer snowplow drivers uh, on the first events. But I, I think what we will do, we're doing, Ms. Graves has, uh, during our municipal lot training, actually set up a cul-de-sac for them to practice uh, with, <laughs> for staff to practice with. But there's nothing like the real game performance. So we'll be doing uh, a lot of practice going forward and getting better at where we place the snow as well, because that can be a big uh, portion 
question. I'm sure you got yeah. conversations about, <laughs> about that in a, in a cul-de-sac. But anything that helps the drivers uh, who are, especially when they're going through at night, it's, it's especially helpful to have any uh, delineators that are available uh, to help them uh, is always helpful. Awesome. Well, I will, I will offer up uh, Pelly Drive, Timothy Lane. We have a sort of subdivision where it's like street, 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 and they have cul-de-sacs on both sides, sort of like barbells. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want a little practice area, yeah, those, those folks would love <laughs> would love the extra help. Um, okay, so uh, my last question uh, was was just for my drive in this morning, which is that I saw a truck loaded with salt uh, over on, uh, in Slavic Village, and I know we're not expecting anything for a couple of days. And so now that we're so staffed up, uh, you know, we have uh, more more drivers than we've had before, but we've had some kind of more temperate weather. What are folks doing for the day, um, and sort of what what are uh, how are we using that staff in those vehicles during? during these warmer, quote unquote, days. Oh, I'm, so, I'm so glad you asked, uh, through the chairman to the councilwoman. Uh, I always like opportunity to celebrate staff, but we have some of the most uh, multidisciplined staff in the country. Uh, the, sa the same staff that handles uh, snow plowing, or it's the same staff that uh, works with the uh, uh, patching crews, graffiti, the leaves that are going on, uh, all those types of programs that uh, go on are still going on at the same time, and we are ready, uh, we stay at the ready to switch between those uh, functions uh, within a moment's notice. I think uh, uh, Mr. Turk back there has got us to the point where we can go from leaves to a snow and ice control event within a half an hour. Wow. Within a half an hour. So uh, that, that's a great uh, uh, testament uh, to our staff and their multidisciplined approaches. Uh, and uh, we, just even yesterday, we were, uh, we got some calls from uh, weather forecast that we thought that uh, overnight, Saturday night, that we were going to be getting some uh, a spot storm, uh, but we were able to sweep. Instead, the weather never came, so we swept uh, the roadways uh, for those uh, shifts. So we, we always have uh, staff uh, with uh, other uh, assignments to do when it's not snowing. The work never stops. Never stops. <laughs> thank right. you very much, Director. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council Memorial, Councilwoman Memorial. All right. Seeing no further questions, um, Director, we appreciate the update, and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, you, Mr. Madam, Madam Clerk, can you uh, excuse the absence of uh, Councilman Joe Jones? All right. I hereby um, the Municipal Services and Properties Committee is adjourned.